Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are the rock, you are the anchor, you are the one thing we can count on in any storm. And Father, it's through our weakness that your grace is made sufficient. So we embrace our weakness, we celebrate our weakness as an opportunity for you to work. We count on you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, who do you really count on? Or maybe the question is, what do you really count on for your peace, for your identity, for your sense of value? I read an interesting article. It was an interview with Michael Jordan when he turned 50 by ESPN. They're talking about what it's like to at one point be the trifecta of three billion dollar uh, brands or million dollar, multi-million dollar brands being that, you know, playing for the Bulls while at the same time you know, Air Jordans with Nike plus having his own company. And he's reflecting at 50, he said, you know what, I would do anything to go back and play basketball. Anything. He said, well, how do you sort of get past this? He, he goes, you don't give past it. You just sort of learn to live with it. He said, it's not just that, but this reporter said, even today, Jordan is still addicted to what his critics say about him. He said, like a, a needle in the vein, he's addicted to people's approval, even getting the approval of his enemies. It was interesting as I read that article, because here's a guy who has everything, and as he's trying to figure out how to transition in the different stages of life with health and other pieces, he's really saying some things I think that you and I might wrestle with. We might say we're Christians. We might say we trust in God. We might call our, know we're getting to heaven by God. But what we really count on for self-worth is people's approval, our money, our career, how well we perform, our health. Yet all of those things, which are good things, if you put your full identity, your full weight on those things, they cannot sustain you. Because eventually, someone's going to perform better than you. Eventually, your health's going to fade. Eventually, you can't make everybody happy. And so God has put a series of feasts in place because he wants us to realize that we can't count on anything securely except him. And I'm not sure that I take enough time in my life to really reflect on whether or not I'm really counting on God, even though I say I am. This is what the Bible calls idols, things that we count on practically besides God. I read a book several years ago by Tim Keller, and it's called Counterfeit Gods. And he asked some questions that I think are helpful in figuring out who you or what you really count on for your sense of identity. First question. Where do your heart and your thoughts effortlessly go when there's nothing else demanding your attention? How to produce more? The need to save more? What people are saying about you or not saying about you? Where do your heart and your thoughts go effortlessly when nothing else is demanding your attention? That is probably the thing you're really counting on. Second thing, if you want to know what you count on, how and where do you spend money easily? No problem writing that check. No problem engaging in that. That might be the thing you really are counting on. Three, what are you living for, and how do you respond to unanswered prayer? Now, none of us like it when our prayers aren't answered, but do you really get angry at God when he doesn't answer that? Because you really wanted your spouse to change, you really want that circumstance to change, you want your kids to be more obedient, you really got to have that health crisis fixed. And you're not just disappointed, that's understandable, you are angry at God. That may show that you're using God to get what you really count on, your health, your kids' obedience, your, your spouse changing, whatever it is. That might be what you're really counting on. You're mad at God for not helping you get more of what you really care about. Last question. What lies beneath your uncontrollable emotions? Where do you have uncontrollable fear? That may speak to what you're really counting on and afraid of losing. What do you have uncontrollable anger? 
that may speak to a, an issue in your life that you're counting on besides God. And God put this, this celebration, this habit, this feast in place called Pentecost to help us understand the cost of overthinking things or over-desiring things besides Him. That's a phrase, actually, Paul used in the New Testament to speak of an idol. When you over-desire something, it's not just your career. You over-desire your career. It's your sense of identity. It's just not just being a good mom and dad. We all want to be a good mom and dad. It's over-desiring being a mom and dad so much that it becomes your identity. And Pentecost was designed to reveal to us the hidden costs of overthinking, over-worrying, over-demanding and over-desiring things besides God. So the Jewish menorah actually has seven pieces because it was to represent the seven feasts. Last week we looked at three of the feasts, which was the Feast of Passover, Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits, all put together in one week of the calendar. We learned that Jesus was, amazingly, 1,500 years later, he died on Passover, he was buried on Unleavened Bread, and he was raised on First Fruits. As if God had put these rehearsals together to teach us about what he was going to do in the future. Now we're going to jump from first fruits all the way to Pentecost. In Pentecost, we're going to reveal several things. One, what does it look like to count on God for your grain in an agricultural community, for your job, for your paycheck, and to keep yourself dependent upon God even when you have good harvest? Two, what does it mean like for you and I to count on God and his Torah, his law, to guide us in our life? That's going to be important on Pentecost. And thirdly, what does it look like for you and I to count on God's presence? That we really need, not theoretically, we really say, God, I cannot live without your presence today, this week in my life. So how do we count on God? Two aspects of Pentecost I want to look at today, and I want to do a drill down on on Pentecost. Number one, Pentecost was set in place so that we would count on God when work is most pressing. It's really amazing. God put this in the most inconvenient time in the calendar possible. Because I think he knows that when work gets tough, when schedules get crazy, as we're about to enter into August, he knows that's the time that our devotional life falls to the wayside. We don't have time for Bible study. Our prayer life sort of goes into the toilet because work is so pressing. So he purposely schedules this, Pentecost, at a time when work is most crazy to tell people they've got to step away and work on their relationship with him, remind themselves of what's really important while work is crazy. Here's where it happened in the calendar. So you had here, at Passover, first fruits, and that was all the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then 50 days later, you have the Feast of Pentecost. Now, in an agricultural community, you'll notice this is right. The barley harvest has already happened. You brought your first barley for the first fruits. God, the first thing out of the ground, I'm trusting you for the future. But then right now, you've had these latter rains occurring in Israel. And so the rains are coming down, and you got the crops are coming up. And those crops are just, you know, ready to be harvested, ready to go. And right as they're just about to be harvested, the busiest time of the agriculture community, busiest time at work, God says, I want you to leave the harvest i got more work to do than... I know. Leave the harvest. One of the three required feasts. Travel all the way to Jerusalem. During harvest time? Yes. And I want you to offer me an offering and take some time to reflect on what I've done in your life. It's the most inconvenient time to travel. And I think God puts it here on purpose because he knows that during the general harvest... During the busiest times of life, we need to step back and remind ourselves that we're trusting on God to be our source. Here's how he says it in the first part of the verse. You shall count for yourself. Pentecost was a time of counting the cost. Count for yourself from the day after Sabbath, first fruits, from the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, first fruits, seven Sabbaths, seven times seven, 49. Count 50 days, so one more day after that, to the day after the seventh Sabbath. And you will offer God a new grain offering. So you gave him a first fruit offering, 50 days later a new grain offering. So the time that life was most busy, work was most pressing, you were literally counting. Day one, we're counting on God, Pentecost is coming. What, what day is it? It's day 14. You literally counted as a family, counted as a community, 50 days to remind yourself when work was busy that you were counting on God by counting the days to Pentecost. 
was this built-in habit God put in our lives so that we would not forget to count on Him at the time we needed Him most for our paycheck. And this habit was so powerful and yet so inconvenient. Why would God put that here? Except I think God knows that you and I sometimes are so busy working in it that we don't work on it. Not just in business, right? You're so busy working in it, meeting deadlines, getting stuff done, getting new, new sales, getting new clients. You're so busy working in it, you don't have time to work on it and say, should we still go in that direction? Do those goals really make sense? We need to step back and work on it. In our marriage, we're so busy, like, who's picking up who at what time? Okay, I got this, I got the kids. We don't step back and say, are the habits and patterns in our marriage sustainable to replenish us, to, to, to make the kind of marriage we want? We're so busy working in it, we don't work on it. I think God knew that for the people of Israel, so he put these habits and feasts in place to force them to work on it throughout the year. If you read the book, The E-Myth Revisited, he talks about this principle of working on it versus working in it. Why many small businesses fail and others succeed. Because often you're so busy with the daily grind, you don't step back to think strategically, to replenish yourself, to to re-examine the business plan. He tells the story of Sarah. Sarah loved making pies. She grew up as a pie maker. She loved new recipes. She loved inventing new recipes. But it went from a hobby to a business. And now she was starting to hate making pies because she had to start the oven at 2 in the morning. She wasn't sleeping well. She's keeping up the demand. She was just getting exhausted. But she didn't have time to think about who she needed to hire, what her pricing structure was, what really was going to sustain the business because she was so busy working in it, she couldn't step back to work on it. Eventually, she hired a business consultant who sat down with her and said, here's the issue. You're so busy in it, you're not working on it. You've got to step back. You need to hire some technicians to take care of those issues so you can think strategically about this as a business, not just somebody who makes recipes. And she began to flourish. I read the interview with a book I'm reading called The, the Tools of the Titans. It's Habits of Millionaires and Billionaires. And one of the interviews was with a guy named uh, Derek Shiver. He invented a company called CD Baby, which was an independent music label. Started in 98, sold in 2008 for $22 million. He said, what is the secret to sustaining life and to sustaining business? He said, well, early in your career, you say yes to everything because you don't know what's going to be a lottery ticket to get you where you need to go. He said, but as I work with 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds, the, the, the advice I give them most is you need to say no to a lot of good things so that you can focus on the things that really matter. And people don't stop and say, why am I growing my business? Why are we so diversified? We're not asking the why enough. He said, I liken it to the story of, uh, of a donkey. He said, the donkey can't decide if he wants to drink or eat. So he looks over at this big thing of water, and he's like, oh, I'm thirsty. And so the donkey sort of leans over toward the water. And then he sees a bale of hay. He's like, but I'm kind of hungry. And so he goes over toward the hay. But he doesn't quite get to the hay when he sees the water again. But I'm really kind of thirsty. And if I eat this all... And the donkey goes back and forth between all these different things, never being able to commit to either one. And eventually the the donkey falls over from both hunger and thirst. He said that often, especially in your 30s and 40s in business, you want to do so many things at once, not realizing you could focus on this for a season. Then you can focus on this for a season. You can drink for a while. Then you can eat for a while. Instead, we try and do everything, and we do everything poorly. I think that's why God puts us in place, to force us to step out of it. We do that in our team. Every two months, we we plan out 18 months of our teaching calendar, 18 months of our strategic planning at church. And every time that meeting's on my calendar, every time, it's incredibly inconvenient. Every time that strategic meeting comes up, I don't want to go. Because every time it comes up, I'm so busy working in it, I don't want to go and work on it. And once I'm there, it's great. We personally catch up with folks. We encourage each other. We pray for one another. We think strategically. But we force that on our calendar because we know that if you don't force it on your calendar, you end up just sort of caught in the grind. So God puts this feast, Pentecost, in a time that work is most pressing to remind us to count on Him. The second thing is God says, I want you to count on God when you're planning your giving. Rather than giving be an emotional response to a sermon or a talk or somebody's story, financial giving was very strategic. 
And Pentecost is very much part of that. You'll see exactly why here in a moment. You shall bring from your dwellings, long travel for this giving, two wave loaves of two-tenths of an ephah. Now, this is so incredible, but we're going to work up to it. So you're bringing two loaves, each made out of two-tenths of an ephah. How much is that? We'll get to it in a second. They shall be of fine flour. If you remember, like 12 weeks ago, 20 weeks ago, I described the process of making fine flour. We'll review that in a second. It was fit for a king, the time and energy required to make fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. Ding, 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 ding. That's going to be really important. And they are the first fruits to the Lord. You shall offer with bread seven lambs of the first year without blemish, one young bull, two rams, and they shall be a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering to the Lord by fire. And it's going to be a sweet-smelling aroma to God. He, he loves this kind of generosity. So what's he saying here? Well, let's, let's get to this idea. How much is an ephah, and what does it take to turn into fine flour? I saw a woman who's living in Israel right now, and she was celebrating Pentecost, and she did this on her own. So first of all, in order to present this offering to God, you had to first grow the right crop. So she's growing here kamut heads of grain in her backyard. Once they grow, months and months of growth, watering, weeding, she then has to thrash them out to get the seeds out from amongst the chaff. The process related to that. So now she's got the seeds. Now she takes those seeds and she made a homemade grinder in her house and she's now going to grind through the seeds. And the whole process of grinding these seeds to make into flour. But even now it's not fine wine, a fine flour, it's coarse. So she coarsely grains it and goes through that process. Then, the next step is she has this coarse grain up in the top left. She then has to sift through that to make it into fine grain, fine flour, and then she's got to regrind the rough stuff to get it finer so it can turn into fine grain. Then she collects it. She pours it into a cup. So now all that work she's gone into it, and she has what? One and a quarter, one and a third cup. Well, two ephahs was eight cups of fine flour to which we go well go down to kroger and buy some so for us we see fine flour we don't understand the intentionality the planning the sacrifice in this giving because it's it's like two bucks but for them to give this offering of fine flour was incredibly strategic giving incredibly sacrificial of time and money to present to god something that's going to be key to saying thanks to God and key to prophecy, as you're going to see in a second. So that all that work for one and a half cups or one and a third, and it was eight cups per uh, loaf of bread. And here's where it gets good. You shall bring your from your dwelling in long trip two wave loaves, each of two tenths of an ephah, eight cups, and they shall be a fine flour. The kind of flour fit for a king is what you give to God, and they shall be baked with leaven. Here's two rabbis who actually baked the bread and made it look like sheaves of, uh, of grain to remind themselves that this was a reminder that God was providing everything we have by presenting this offering. Now, this may not catch you initially, so let me back you up. As we've gone through the book of Leviticus, we learned that leaven is always a symbol of sin. And so God said, never, 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 never in the temple offer anything with leaven in it. Until Pentecost. Why on Pentecost would he want you to offer not one but two loaves? And why would suddenly, no leaven ever, except on this day, you were to bake leaven or yeast or the symbol of sin into your bread? 1500 B.C. Moses is writing this. Remember it's called a convocation or rehearsal for what's to come. So what happens in the New Testament at Pentecost? Well, on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down and the church is born. What is the church? A time when Jews and Gentiles are formed into one community. Perfect people? Oh, no, no, no. People with leaven. People who are sinful. People who do the wrong thing. But they are now covered in the same way the bread covers the leaven... Jesus will cover us and the Holy Spirit will come and be an escrow account or a a deposit of what's to come, a guarantee that we are forgiven and we have access to heaven even here and now through Jesus. 
These two loaves of bread for 1,500 years were the predictive object lesson God gave for his future vision of the church and his future vision that you and I don't have to pretend we don't have sin. We can know we can be covered from our sin because of the ultimate Pentecost. 1,500 years in advance. Which brings us then to Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Where Jesus said, I'm going to leave for a while, but I'm going to pray. And God's going to send his Holy Spirit to come upon the church. And this Acts 2, it it begins this way. That when the day of Pentecost had fully come. That's been going on for 1,500 years. But he says, all the other Pentecosts fully came. They all fully pointed toward this Pentecost. They were all rehearsals for this moment in time. Predictions for this moment in history. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place. Now believe it or not, 20 weeks ago I made you a commitment that I would explain why I think the disciples are not in the upper room, but why they're at temple. Because I I did it like in a conclusion to a message and you're like, I've never heard that before and that's weird. So let me start by saying I might be wrong. I'm never surprised when I'm wrong. But I'm going to give you my best take on why I think the disciples were not in the upper room why they were in the temple on Pentecost when this occurs. Number one, it doesn't start by telling us they're in the upper room. It says they're in a place. Hmm. So where do Jewish people go on the day of Pentecost? To a place. Well, it's always the temple. That's where you celebrate the feast. Suddenly, when they're in this place, there came a sound from heaven. Why is there a sound? A rushing mighty wind. Why is there wind? And it filled the whole house. Something fills the house. Where they were sitting. Now this phrase, the house, was a common Jewish idiom for the temple. If you remember in the book of Luke, they come to get Jesus and they lost Jesus. Which is always unfortunate. You lose your keys, you lose your wallet, don't lose the Son of God. So they lost Jesus. And so they lose Jesus and they find Jesus and he says, Did you not know that I would be in my father's house? He's talking about the temple. So it's a common Jewish idiom to describe the temple as the house of God. Now, it's used later in Stephen's speech in Acts. He says, Solomon built God a house in Acts 7.47. So the idea of calling the temple a house was very, very common. Two, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place. Now, if we go back to the book of Luke, often we hear the idea that the, the disciples were all cowering in a, in a room until Pentecost came. Then they finally got enough courage to go out. That's actually not what it says at the end of Luke. At the end of Luke, after his resurrection, after his ascension, it says, if you want to know where to find the disciples, they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. So, the book of Luke, same guy who wrote Acts, says the disciples are daily hanging out in the temple. Also, Peter, in his big speech in Acts chapter 2, he says, guys, we're not drunk. The Holy Spirit's come upon us. It's not drunk for crying out loud. It's the third hour of the day. Because their day started at 6 a.m., the third hour meant 9 a.m. He's saying, guys, it's 9 a.m. Listen, we're not drunk. It's 9 a.m. Now, 9 a.m. is important. Because where would a Jewish person be at 9 a.m. on the day of Pentecost? Well, that was the hour you called to prayer. Everyone who was Jewish was in Pentecost at the temple at the ninth hour. Two, how is Peter addressing these thousands of people and where do they come from? Suddenly they realize, hey, something's going out the door. No, they're all there at temple as he's speaking. They all see this act of wind. They see this act of fire. This is a monstrous demonstration of God's power. Next point. When the day of Pentecost had come, there's these sounds. There's something filling the temple and there's fire. Why is that? Well, Jewish rabbis... They began to trace why Pentecost was important. And they said that after Passover and the deliverance from Egypt, they calculated that it was 50 days later that Moses brought the law down, the Torah down, for the people. So they celebrated Pentecost for most of history as a time that God brought the law to them. God brings the rain down for your harvest. He brought the law or the way of freedom down for you as people. So God is now going to connect the ultimate Pentecost to even that Pentecost. Look at the connections between Moses bringing the law down in Exodus and Jesus bringing the Holy Spirit down in Acts 2. In Acts 19, Mount Sinai was completely in smoke. Oh, there's smoke. And it's it's filled up with it. 
Because the Lord descended upon it with fire. Oh, there's fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. There's a great sound. In fact, a sound of the blast of a trumpet occurred long and became louder and louder, and Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. 1500 B.C. Let's jump forward to about 1000 B.C. Solomon now builds not a tabernacle, but a temple. He says, God, come, dwell in this place that we've made for you. Dwell in this place that we've, we've, we've built for you. And God comes upon the temple in Chronicles and says, The house of the Lord was filled, filled up with smoke so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. God's filling the temple. And the glory of the God filled the house. One more point. The fire, why is there fire over their heads? If, except if you remember in Leviticus chapter 9, we learn that when you offered a burnt sacrifice, your very best lamb, your very best goat, fire one time jumped out of the holy place and came and consumed the dead sacrifice. Remember that? Chapter 9. So the fire jumps out of the holy place and consumes the burnt sacrifice. The same thing happens with Solomon when he builds the temple. Solomon finished praying and fire comes down from heaven and burns up the burnt or dead offerings and sacrifices and the glory of God filled the temple. Now we jump to Acts 2. They, uh, sorry, there appeared to them the disciples divided fire. What's happening here? The same thing has been going on for all the Pentecost. Fire comes and consumes the burnt offering. Fire comes and fills the temple. But now something weird's happening. It's not fire in one place for a bunch of dead animals. The fire is coming upon each individual person. But the principle's still the same. God is saying, I'm starting a new thing. No longer is there a building that's a temple. Now you're the temple. And my fire has come to rest in you. Which is why Paul says in Corinthians, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives here. And the Holy Spirit is a deposit, a guarantee of heaven to come. God lives here. And rather than being a dead sacrifice of an animal, you are now the living sacrifice. God has come upon you that you and I would live as sacrifices, live uh, denying self, live bringing death to self, living saying my whole life, wherever I go the temple is, wherever I go the sacrifice is occurring, how I serve my neighbor, how I serve my family, how I give to the community how I work hard for my clients. All of this is a spiritual act of worship, Paul says in Romans 12, because you are a living sacrifice. And this is what Pentecost was about, realizing God is going to do a new work, that you're the temple, you're the sacrifice, and you are the very indwelling of God. One more little thing about this. So, then after after Peter gives this incredible speech... To at least 3,000 people are baptized, which means there's a whole lot more there. How does he address that many people? If you go back in the day and look at temple, here's the temple wall. If you were a visitor, you would be traveling through, and the first thing you would notice is there are swimming pools. They're called mikvahs. We see the remains even today. There's hundreds and hundreds of mikvahs all around the stairs. And you would make your way up. Doo, 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 doo. And as you made your way up, there doorways were here to get into temple. So the first thing you did on your way to temple is you would actually wash yourself in the mikvah because you had to be clean to come into sacred space. Well, I believe Peter was somewhere near this very spot. One, because you can stand right here and you could address easily 10,000 people. It's a natural amphitheater. Two, you get done preaching and communicating what God has done. Hey, we're not drunk. It's ninth hour. You're hearing stuff because God's doing incredible work. And where in the world are you going to baptize 3,000 people? Huh. Huh. How convenient that as he spoke here, and lots and lots of people listened, those who gladly received the word were baptized that day, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to their number, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Peter literally could go, you want to get baptized? You want to see a picture of what God's done to you? You've died with him in Christ, and you're raised with him? All these adults... Who are trusting Christ for the first time for their salvation. And he says, literally, there's a hundred baptisms right over here. Why don't we get baptized? And they got baptized right there next to the temple. Now, I might be wrong on that view. The truth that we're temples 
And the truth that we're sacrifices is true no matter where it occurred. But it is so incredible to see how what God is doing in Acts 2 was the fulfillment in actual location as well to exactly what had been predicted 1,500 years in advance. Pentecost was designed to count the cost of trusting something besides God for his presence, for your work, and the law or the way of how you live. Pentecost would remind I'm counting. Am I really counting on God for my decisions? Am I counting on God for my paycheck? Am I counting on God to give me decisions and plans for how I organize my life and my business? So this next section really gives us three applications on how we can count on God. And I'll give you these three. Number one, count on God to bring down what you most need today. The rain, the law, and his presence. Number one, Pentecost is a reminder that God sent forgiveness down. So be thankful. Live a thankful life. When you came to Pentecost, you would thank God for forgiving you at Passover. You would thank him for the first fruits of what he's already given you in your paycheck. And it was another way of saying thanks because of the forgiveness and provision he's had for you. And so you would bring a decontamination offering. We learned about that like 15 weeks ago, the sin offering. You'd bring a peace offering known as the thank you God offering. And this was a very common offering. It's why I saying, God, thank you for how generous you've been. Thank you for how gracious you've been. Thank you for how faithful you've been. Thank you for not giving up on me even when I gave up on you. It was a time of thanksgiving for everything God has done to step out of your life and reflect on all of God's blessings and provision. And you would offer the wave offering, a reminder of the first fruits of your paycheck, and you'd also offer two lambs, the way of saying thank you for his forgiveness. Two. Because God sent his law down at Pentecost with Moses, God wants you to walk in that freedom. If you weren't with us last week, here was the main point last week. God wants us to organize into our schedule habits of rest and replenishment and rejuvenation for one main reason. They were in slavery for 400 years. Slaves don't feast. And slaves don't rest. And so God wanted them to use his way, which is what the word Torah means, the way, to organize their life to not be enslaved in their new life. And if you can't rest and replenish and work on your marriage, enjoy your relationship, enjoy that lake house you bought, enjoy and replenish at times, you might be enslaved to producing, enslaved to creating. If you can't get away from your phone or Facebook, I just feel guilty saying that. You might still be enslaved to your technology, though you're supposed to be free. And so God said, I want you to proclaim, call people out to these habits, call people out to this way of living in rest and living in joy and throwing lots of parties and having lots of community. And make sure you do it on the same day. And no, it's a holy holiday is where we get the word holiday from a holy day. It's a holy day. It's a convocation, a rehearsal for something to come to you. To live in this way of rest. To live in this this pattern of life. And you shall do no customary work. And if you can't find a day, if you can't find a time of year that you're unplugging from work, then you might be still a slave. I want you to live in freedom practices, freedom habits. And it will be a statute forever for you in your dwellings throughout your generations. To say, God, I need your law or I overwork. I need your law, or I overthink. I need your law, or I overworry. I need you to bring down to me what I most need. I'm reading the book. It tells a story of uh, just faith stories of people in, uh, in Vietnam. I was reading the story of Alan Clark. He got home from Vietnam, and he was almost recovered from the physical damage to his body from war. He was just starting the process, but making great progress on the psychological damages from war. But the thing that was really the stickler from him was that his wife and his marriage just weren't going well, his wife Jackie. And as they were experiencing this conflict, it really came down to she could not, she said, I just cannot forgive you for what you've done. Because he he knew what he had done. He volunteered. He wasn't drafted. He volunteered to go to Vietnam to serve and to protect. And she was so angry she couldn't forgive him for that. So he came to his pastor and said, listen, God's doing some incredible healing, but the thing that matters most to me, my marriage, I don't know what to do. 
His pastor said, well, here's what Jesus says. Pray to the God of the heaven, of the God of the harvest, harvest metaphor, that he would send workers, he would bring down to those to replenish the, to, to bring in the crops. He said, let's pray that God will bring into your spouse's life something that will help her experience forgiveness. It's like, that's all you got, Pastor? I was hoping for something a lot better than let's pray for... But he said he began to pray. And it was a, an ongoing prayer. Not as long as most, actually. He prayed for a day, nothing. Two days, nothing. Three days. He said about two weeks later, praying fervently that God would bring down into her life what she needed. She pulled him aside. She said, I was watching something the other day. I happened to flip on TV. I never watch religious television. And there was a show about forgiveness. And I found myself just plugged into it. And it spoke about the need to forgive and unforgiveness and how damaging that is to, to us personally and to our relationships. And I realized I needed to forgive you. It's not really fair, what I, how, but, but, but I, I asked God to give me the capacity to forgive. And I did. And Alan said to his pastor, I'm learning the power of push, which I never heard before. Push. Pray until something happens. Push prayers. God, I'm asking you to bring down what I need, the rain. Bring down what I need, your way. Bring down what I need, your presence, so I can sustain the power or the challenge or the difficulty I'm in. So, God sent his law down on Pentecost, so remember to rest in freedom by asking God to bring down to you what you need. And then lastly, he concludes with this. He comes back to generosity. Because God was so faithful in keeping his promises and so generous to you, be generous to others as well. When you go into your crops and your fields, don't reap every conceivable thing. Don't feel like you need to get every conceivable thing out of your field. Don't overwork, overproduce in such a way. You shall not wholly, every single piece, reap the corners of your field. Leave the corners of the field. It's okay. Put a little margin in your life. Not only that, but by not... By not gr uh, gleaning the, the, the corners of your crop, you're not only going to have a little margin for yourself, but I want you to leave those for the poor, that the poor can come and they can work and they can glean. And so you're going to leave edges of your crops out in a way of saying, God, you've been generous to me. I want to be generous to others. God, you've told me that I'm free so I can rest. And so in order to rest, I don't have to get every single penny out of this uh, crop this year. And if you do that, he says, you shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. And by that, people recognize this is a different type of lifestyle you're living than the nations around you. You're freer, you're walking in a way, and you're trusting God. You're counting on God for everything you have. That's the power of the habit of Pentecost. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the call in our lives, for your presence. We thank you for the ultimate Pentecost that you came upon us in your Holy Spirit as we go out today, Father, may we be living sacrifices for you. May we be temples bringing your presence into our everyday relationships. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being here today.